Conesty, how are you? Welcome back to the Candlelit Tales podcast, where we tell stories from Irish mythology and then talk about them afterwards. My name is Surika, and I'm half of the sibling storytelling duo. And this spring, we are talking about the greatest Irish high king, Cormac MacArt. In this episode, we are picking up with little baby Cormac after the events of the last episode. And if that confuses you, you can go back and listen to the first episode in this series, Art and Acton, and catch up with them. This podcast is brought to you by our supporters at Patreon. And if you would like to support us, you can go over there and join them. You can like, you can comment, you can share, you can subscribe. But above all, you can sit back and relax and let us tell you a story. Warmth curled and surrounded love and embrace sleep closed eyes infant's breath breathing with its mother warm and nurturing breathing in her love and protection awoken with a start a nuzzle cold and wet Bright blue eyes blinking wide A smile meeting the open mouth With sharp teeth, dark eyes and pointed ears A wet tongue licking over his face The gurgle of laughter and small hand reaching into the mouth did not close down, but simply nuzzled in amongst the wrappings that he was surrounded in, hoisted up, he began to feel himself being pulled away from the warmth, his mother lying, his wolf now carrying him away. The soft trot of her paws on the ground, the sky opening wide, the colours all around, bright and beaming he looked with wonder at the leaves and the trees, colours of flowers, things he could not comprehend but in this moment filled his senses to be in this bundle beneath the jaws of this great woolly, shaggy, hairy wolf. The wolf carried him away, beyond the trees, far into the hills, and there he found himself placed in and around many curled up bodies, other babies not blinking his bright eyes, better at looking, their sharp ears, better for hearing, his gurgled laughter, they turned, sniffed and licked, and pawed and clawed, his face and belly scraped by sharp claws until the snarl kept them at bay. The mother wolf walking around all of the babes crawling and jumping and circling around the new babe who laughed and played blinked and displayed affection with hands without claws his face now in amongst the hair and warmth closeness of the wolf pack as he blinked his eyes and slept deeply. And on the third day after her son was taken, Oxen realised that the wolf knew what she was doing. 
when the soldiers of Louis Macon came. They were rough, and they hauled her outside. And one of their physicians confirmed she had given birth not long ago. And they questioned her, and they shouted at her father, who remained serene. They turned the place upside down. Harsh voices, harder hands, and they hadn't drawn a circle of protection around her baby against hands. But although they searched high and low, they could not find her son. There was no sign of him. And when at last they left, Octon threw herself into her father's arms. They held each other. She told him she understood now, she trusted now. But the trust did not make the grief any easier. She was still separated from her baby. She still wept. She felt the pain in her body, in her breasts that were swollen with milk and no child to relieve the pain. She grieved for the moments she was losing. Could he smile yet? Would he be speaking yet if he were with them? How big are babies when they start to crawl and creep about on all fours? When do they start to stand up and walk? She didn't know. The child was her first. The bright, cold sky illuminating the mouth of the cave overlooking the forest. The leaves and the trees budding and bringing and brimming to life. The wolf mother exits the cave and walks and prowls, left alone with his brothers and sisters, the little baby played, jostled, curled and then crawled up and back and around as the furry ones climbed and jumped. Eventually their eyes blinked open. Each day their mother returned. He would suckle with them until they stopped and began to tear into flesh. Their mother brought them back. He had no interest, no ability to tear the flesh and rip off the bone and devour the nutrients. He suckled instead and his wolf mother was happy to let it happen. He watched the fullness of the trees bringing in the fruits with the leaves. A bounty of fruit this baby managed to get his hands upon when playing at the edge of the trees. Tasty, nice, sweet until those leaves began to fall on the ground the sky darkening less light leaking into the cave more time to feel the warmth of his brothers and sisters now much bigger much stronger he was weak in comparison small and helpless they were fierce and agile he still suckled. They now hunted. He still played. Surrounded by strength and ferocity that he knew would not be turned against him. His weakness, not a worry. Not something to cause him to cry. Until the day a hunter came 
and ripped him away from his family and the pack of wolves. The wheel of the year turned. Full circle. Before a tracker came to the druid's house. Carrying a bundle. Acton heard the child cry. And he was in her arms before she realised that she was moving. Snatched out of the hands of the tracker. And only when she pulled away the cloth and checked him over every inch of his skin to make sure that he was still as perfect as he had been when she held him last. Only then did she turn to the tracker and ask him what happened. Still running her hands over her child's soft skin, feeling his warmth, smelling the scent of him. And the tracker said that he'd followed the tracks of a she-wolf back to her lair. And he'd seen wolf cubs playing outside the cave. And a child playing with them. And so, before the she-wolf returned, he'd snatched the child up and left. And where else would he bring him? but to the druid and the druid's daughter. Akta knew now that she could trust in the world of the beasts in a deeper way than she ever had before. She had always trusted the wild horses. They had never hurt her. And now the wolves were kin to her son, Cormac. She named him to honour that connection. But man still posed a threat. The king still posed a threat. And so she bade her father farewell and set off to the north to Art's foster father, Fiachna Kassan. She travelled alone in her chariot, her own horses pulling her These ones were tamed, truly tamed, not just to her hand, but to the hand of any man or woman. And her child, Cormac, bundled beside her. She did not like letting him out of her sight these days. Not even out of her touch, if she could help it. But as they were crossing the mountain, she heard them. And Cormac heard them too. The wolves. They're howling. She felt her heart quake in fear. She saw her son pull himself up by his arms and laugh with glee to hear his cradle song. The wolves drew closer and Octon drove her horses on. And even on the treacherous ground, they moved swiftly for her, carrying her across the mountain as she heard the voices of the wolves draw closer and closer. She could feel her own fear rising up in her and her son's delight beside her and the horses, their tension and hers picking their way as swift as they could on the narrow path. And then, before her, Octin saw a she-wolf. Surrounding her, wolves, teeth bared, eyes gleaming, advancing, She snatched her son up and held him to her, even as he wriggled and tried to get free and back 
to the first mother he'd ever known. But Octon felt everything in her say no. The wolves had had their time with her son. But he was hers. And he belonged to this world of men as well. And so she called. She was the druid's daughter. Her call went through the earth. Her call went through the roots. And for a moment she thought it was unanswered. She only heard the wolves snarl. She knew she could let her son go. She could flee, the wolves would let her. But if she held on to him, they would tear her apart and bring him back as their own child. Claim him for their own. And then she heard a sound like thunder. The hoofbeats of the horses. They were not horses Octon had seen before. She did not know if they were wild or if they were the herd of Maeve Lathara Gatara or if they were the horses that Maka raced. She only knew that they came and they made a circle of protection around her and her child and her chariot and snarling and snapping, the wolves backed away. And Octon claimed her child and carried him to his new home. And Fiachna Kassan, when he realized who this wild looking woman was and who her son's father was, He opened his home to them. He promised to keep Cormac MacArt safe, to teach him, to train him, so that one day he could be king.